today we have um, Akane Shimange, who is the director of Matimba, who will take on the conversation from here. Um, and I hand over to Akane Shimange. Akane, over to you. Thanks, Immaculate. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for another webinar. I am Akani, as Immaculate has said. My pronouns are they and them. And I'm the director of Matimba, an organization based in South Africa that works with trans youth. So basically for the last few weeks, we've had a lot happening within our community. We've lost siblings due to transphobia. We've been living through a pandemic. We have watched and participated in global uprisings against systems of oppression. And as painful as the last few weeks have been, I think there have been a number of glorious outcomes. As governments pull back on trans rights, we've become more united and realize that we have led revolu revolutions, and so we will still lead this revolution. Um, and on today's webinar, it's going to be on trans youth, and it's intentional that it's on this day, because in 1976, there's a Soweto uprising, which was a series of demonstrations and protests led by black school children in South Africa. These demonstrations were a response to the introduction of Afrikaans as a medium, as the medium of instruction in local schools during apartheid. It's estimated that about 20,000 students participated. They were met with intense police brutality, which seems to have been a continuous thing and seems to be part of the uprisings right now. And about 100 students were killed. The outcome of these uprisings was the UN Security Council um, passing Resolution 392, which strongly condemned the incidents and the apartheid government, which reminds us all that the youngest people in the room can also be the most influential. So I have the honor to be in conversation with three very brilliant trans people um, on being trans, being young, and living in these unprecedented times. I'll invite them all individually to introduce themselves. We'll start with um, Noam, then Yang, then Wanzile. Um, yes. Um, hi, so I'm Noam, I'm 24. Um, and I spent a decent amount of time uh, coaching high school students, which means that I actually already feel quite old relatively. Uh, my pronouns are here and they, um, and I'm currently doing my master's efforts. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Yan, can you hear me? Okay, well, we'll wait for Yan. Wenzile, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Wenzile? Sorry, I think they might be having technical difficulties. With them. Hello. Hi, Lindsay. I was muted for a while, sorry. Um, I'm Lindsay Letwala. I'm a previous VET student, did my honors in history at VET. Uh, I'm currently 23. I work as an intern at Gala Queer Archives. And I also like just do, I randomly like blog at times on YouTube, talking about just navigating relationships, dating and life as a young trans person in South Africa. Thank you, Enzile. Um, I'm not managing to reach Ian. Um, hopefully he'll be able to join I'm us. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Um, Yang, please introduce yourself with your pronouns. Okay, I'm Yang. 
genius J Ngandui. Uh, currently, I'm not working, just home. My preferred pronouns are him, his. Here in Zambia, Lusaka, the capital city. Um, a transgender person, trans man in general. And looking forward to what the meeting has for us, young trans persons in general. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to also apologize on behalf of Zozo, who was supposed to be part of the panel. Um, she's been having technical difficulties for the last 30 minutes. Um, so I think first off, I'll ask this question to all three of you. Um, so in the last two decades, the fight for trans and gender diverse rights has gained momentum and a lot has been achieved within the region, be it the formation of organizations, access to gender affirming healthcare in very different ways based on context and access to gender, legal gender recognition in some countries. Do you believe that these gains have been inclusive of trans and gender diverse youth and minors? Um, I, I guess um, I'll start just alphabetically, um, unless anyone else wants to hop in. Um, you can start now. Cool. Sure. So um, I think the so first of all i think my my understanding comes from quite like a privileged point and even you know in the the trans folk that that i speak to it is often like from that very specific lens uh but within that lens i worry quite a bit um specifically for trans youth in terms of what it means to to be going um, through transition or just um, understanding your identity at a moment when transness is very visible in the media, when it is, when it does feel like to an extent we do have these landslide slide rights, um, what it then means for trans youth who are then delegitimized by saying, you know, you're going with a fad or you're going, um, yeah, kind of you're doing this because like it's popular and cool right now, uh, which is something that I've unfortunately heard a lot of people have to deal with. And so I think that kind of that flip side from visibility and access also then means that to the public eye, it can look almost like um, a fun spectacle. And so I worry about that. And then I think more specifically around the inclusion, and this is specifically, if I think about the NGO sector, a lot of funding that NGOs get often around trans uh, people is specifically on the African content, it's so intrinsically linked to the idea of stopping AIDS or stopping uh, the risk of suicidal ideations. Um, and so, I think this is something we've been seeing quite a bit recently, but I think very often, specifically international NGOs, worry much more about our deaths than I, they do about our lives. And I think that part of that then does ignore trans youth, does ignore trans joy. Um, and specifically with that fixation of AIDS, it's completely kind of, um, takes trans youth out of the discussion entirely. Um, yeah, I think that's... Mm, um, I think, uh, I think um, a lot of, I do believe a lot of strides, strides have been made in terms of all like legal gender recognition, access to healthcare for a lot of, um, young trans people in South Africa. Um, unfortunately, what I've witnessed also is that um, 
uh, coming from uh, I, I come into this into spaces as a black trans woman, but I'm also like um, university educated in a way. And I realize a lot of younger children in the township who may be trans, who are grappling with their gender, do not know about what transness is, do not even know that they do have the rights to go to a home affairs to change their gender marker. They don't even know that it's actually possible to medically transition. It's even now with the visibility, I still witness when I talk to um, younger people and in schools, a lot of a lot of youth still do not know that it's possible. Even you go to, sometimes you go to even home affairs, home of people, the staff that works there are not aware of things such as changing gender marker. Even healthcare professionals, some don't even know that uh, anything about trans, trans um, uh, gender affirm, affirming care, even if it's available within the the facility. Um, that has just been my observation so far with interacting with younger people and school kids. Thank you, Norman and Zile. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so actually, yes, access to health services for transgender persons are there, but like my colleague has just mentioned, the transgender persons are not recognized fully. So the services are there, but they are not given accordingly. And this this is a big challenge for us when we go to, to these healthcare facilities to access a service, they'll start questioning you and asking you questions that won't be comfortable to you. In the end, you end up lying and get a wrong service just to, 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 to be in line with the, the, the provider. Talking about the legal gender recognition, no, it's not there. We aren't recognized in general as that we exist or something like that. I don't feel, I don't think we are recognized as it is because uh, we're still struggling to, to, to the gender markers to, to, be, to be there for, for, for us also to be recognized and have that, that box to say this one is a transgender person or trans man or trans woman. It's not there. So legally, we are not recognized. But other things, expressions, telling to our needs, I think there's still some gaps that needs to be tightened up, more especially healthcare services. And uh, like the question here is highlighting organizations being formed, organizations that are there, they are really doing their best to provide or give the best information to trans persons so that they can understand themselves in general. But it's not everyone who's opening up to say I'm a trans person. So we we'll still have a lot to do so that each and every young person may be able to recognize themselves and come out to say I'm trans. So if you, that's my experience as a young trans person. Thank you all so much. I feel you bring you bring to the forefront a number of very important important points. Um, there's a mentioning of how visibility is also at the same time, as much as it affirms us, it has also delegitimized people's experiences being seen as a fad, and how funding still within the region um, is still directed by the global north and basically decides for us what our struggles are, which is usually HIV, which is 
not the conversation we're having. It's part of the conversation, but it's not the, convers the main conversation we're having. Um, Kunzilu, you brought to the forefront the limitations of language and how as much as we can continuously have this information that seems to not be permeating, um, I guess, governments, hospitals. And so even if we know the facts and we know these things, um, when we go to hospitals, we do not get the healthcare required because they don't know, home affairs doesn't know. And yeah, you brought the, the difference between um, South Africa and Zambia where the first two spoke on legal gender recognition and legal gender recognition being something that is highly inaccessible within, within the continent. Um, and currently I think there's only two countries that have um, any form of legal gender recognition for trans individuals. Um, you also said the organizations are doing as much as they can, but there's a lot of gaps and how accessing gender affirming healthcare still requires you to go through discrimination and stigmatization within hospitals. Um, and I think that leads me to my next question, which is what challenges do you feel um, are firstly unique to you and unique to um, trans youth? Um, and do you think that these challenges have been highlighted and or exacerbated by the current pandemic? Um, can I sure. ask when? Okay, uh, no, you no, can sure. start. No, it's fine. Uh, no, it's, uh, oh, okay. Um, well, I think um, kind of very specific to myself is uh, kind of just as um, the COVID-19 pandemic was, I guess, beginning, um, I had just been approved for uh, top surgery, which was then for uh, very like obvious and legitimate reasons put on hold um, in, because the hospitals needed to use all of their resources um, to deal with COVID-19 patients. Um, and so that's, you know, obviously a very understandable stance, but at the same time uh, to then, first of all, be so close to a goal and then it be taken away uh, was quite painful, but then also have it taken away under the guise of, well, this is cosmetic surgery, so it's not that important or it's not life-saving um, has been quite harmful. Uh, then again, on, I guess, more of a personal level, I'm very grateful uh, to not be living with my parents. I think that um, for so many of us, because our parents and our families hold such specific views of who we are, um, it can be incredibly difficult as um, a, a trans youth to not have those outside spaces. And I think that that's also something important to remember that even though transness is a very individual journey, being able to live transness almost through trans or gender non-confirming um, positive spaces, being able to meet up with other trans folk, being able to figure out your ident identity socially as well. I think for so many of us, that's such an important way through which we are able to understand ourselves. And so to have all of that taken away um, and now kind of be solely by yourself or very possibly be in incredibly toxic and um, gender um, and, and households which are not gender affirming um, and not have those kind of trans or queer outlets in which you can go to, not being able to see friends who, who will then affirm you. I think all of that can be incredibly difficult. Um, and then I think in terms of dysphoria, in a way it's good because you don't have to think as much about your body on a day-to-day -day basis, but at the same time, there's just so few distractions from the things that you don't like about your body. Or, you know, there's just so few distractions from those negative thoughts while 
in isolation. Um, but yeah, I think really just that closure of, of queer spaces or trans spaces specifically at a moment that feels so heavy um, is just a great loss of community. Mm. Um, I agree with um, I agree with Noam in the sense that our a lot of youth, a lot of um, trans youth, um, queer youth, we are we find a community within these spaces such as NGO organizations. Um, for one, um, Gala, which I work for, these types of, of queer um, spaces, they provide, in a way, a moment to breathe. They provide a moment to actually exhale and be like, I'm with my people, I'm with community, I won't be judged in this space. And ever since um, COVID-19, I've, it's um, not only for myself, but many other young people. Mental health is one thing that um, is a challenge. Like it's a challenge in the sense that um, if you are stuck with family that's toxic um, and do not agree with, uh, I guess your gender identity, you have to deal with that um, toxicity while also enduring this pandemic. You have to, I'm also thinking about um, the dreams that have been paused because a lot of young people, the biggest way to escape, um, I guess a toxic environment is getting employment it's getting some form of, like some form of income that can allow you to move out of the space that is home if home is toxic and i think about how that just all those issues find not having a sense of community not having the financial resources to not only support yourself but ex um remove yourself from these toxic environments and I believe a lot of uh, young people have voiced, um, including myself, how mental health can, it can deteriorate during this time, the, like um, depending on how much support you have currently. Um, challenges that I've faced in the last three months. Challenges I've faced in the last three months. Personally, it's the issue to do with employment. Um, things have now become hard, at least previously before the pandemic. I was able to do some peace works, find a little money to at least buy something for myself. But now it's hard because wherever you go, you won't be allowed to do anything because there's this COVID-19 everywhere. Wherever you find these peace works, they tell you no, we're not giving here because of the disease, the virus and stuff like that. So employment for me has been a very big challenge. And another thing is accessing health services when you go to the hospital. It's it's hard to be attended to like as the first person you go because they'll first test you, do a lot of things on you, and the nurses are always busy and stuff like that. So with the fear of also being in contact with the, someone who has the virus, it's also a fear for me to go to the health facility and access a service. So at the end of the day, I just self-medicate, to be honest. 
when I have a headache or whatever thing, I self-medicate. I don't go to the hospital because I fear to be in contact with someone who's with the virus or just to be in clouded places because mostly these health facilities are clouded most of the time. And another thing is um, money to, to, to pay for my rentals. I'm staying alone. I used to stay with my parents, but I shifted like seven months ago. So now money for my rentals is hard for me to find because I'm not able to do those peaceworks that I used to do to raise money. So it's very hard at the moment and uh, very difficult for me to find money for the rentals and also put food on the table. Another challenge is uh, just getting things back to normal is a very big challenge for me. So I feel now that it's reducing here in Zambia, maybe things will get back to normal, as we are calling it a new normal. But it will be hard again to start, start over and just try to put things to, to a new normal and stuff like that. Yeah. I think those are the three to four main challenges that I've faced in the past three months. Thank you. And thanks for allowing into those spaces. Um, you've highlighted a number of things and I think we all understand how even of these things, even if the general public speaks of how these things have been difficult, um, trans and gender diverse individuals experience this at such a higher level. Um, there's a highlight of mental health issues that comes for that comes with um, living maybe with your parents and parents that are not affirming. Um, the highlight of how dysphoria um, is heightened when there are no other distractions in the world you know. and all you do is sit with yourself. Um, the how community and I guess spaces, this is why spaces like this are important, how community um, is a space in which we are seen. Um, and now that we're all social distancing and staying at home, there is no community, no physical community. Um, yeah, and you highlighted the economic struggles of trans individuals and how when people are losing jobs, we are obviously losing jobs at a higher rate. And that means lack of security, that means lack of access to healthcare. And these are things that a lot of trans youth are currently facing. And I think it's important to highlight them even for the organizations in the room so that we can have a broader conversation about how we do we plot our um, response to COVID, which leads to my last question. And, um, and I'd like to invite all three of you to give direct points as bluntly as possible. Um, and my last question is, how do you feel activists and organizations can better adapt their response to COVID-19? to include trans youth and not just create things that are based on what the public have told us responses should look like. Um, like the last three questions, we'll just start with those. Okay, uh, sure. So um, I think right now there has to be a massive focus on the ways in which all of our bodies become violated as we move back into the public 
And so um, I've heard from many film presenting people how they just have one part of COVID-19 has been able to take a breather from the constant assault of um, sexual harassment. And so I think for, for trans youth in particular, um, what that means is um, for trans masculine folk, you know, specifically possibly uh, going back to wearing a binder on a day-to-day -day basis and what that means for, for health. And so, although this may not be uh, a specific adaptation, mm -hmm. I think uh, NGOs need to be incredibly careful at looking at this moment in which people are re-entering public spaces and the violence that exists within those public spaces. Then I think um, there has to be ways in which these kinds of discussions occur with as much anonymity as possible. Again, specifically because we're looking at populations that very specifically probably aren't out at home, but very desperately need to be able to be part of these conversations. And so how we ensure privacy while also ensuring that as many people as possible are available. We all know already that data is a struggle <laughs> um, and you know how we then very explicitly ensure that the people who need to have help and need to be heard are able to be heard when they can't access facilities physically. Um, and I just, yeah, I think those are the main things I, um, for this particular question. Uh, uh, from my, from my, um, perspective, I feel like NGOs, uh, with the current climate of everything, um, I agree, I, I agree with the point previously made about protecting, um, um, anon anonymity for, uh, queer youth that um, may be uh, participating in mm -hmm. um, queer youth that may be participating in these um, discussions um, or accessing care from some kind of uh, care or service from the NGOs and um, I don't know if it's particular to NGOs only, but it's when, like when, um, I feel like when research is done on young uh, trans people, young LGBT people, I think also it should be considered um, some of the I think there should be some some form of, uh, I guess, uh, re uh, remuneration for young people going into these spaces and helping, talking about their experiences um, to NGOs, to researchers, to uh, to to academics. I think there should there should be some form of um, aid given to these, um, to, to us and uh, yeah, I don't, like, uh, I'm struggling to formulate a Korean answer, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's my point for now. Um, Yang, yeah. are you still with us? Yes. We are on the third question. Sorry, I was off a bit. The network is tripping here. Okay. Um, 
So the third question is, how do you feel activists and organizations can better adapt their response to COVID-19 to include trans youth and young people? Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if Yang can hear us. Uh, he highlighted that his network is going off. Um, okay. Hi. Hi. Are you watching it? Sorry? Dan, are you able to hear me? Hi. Hi. Thank you. Uh, are you about to get me? Yes, yeah, yes. I can Are you able to get me as well? Yeah. Okay, I think there's a there's a delay between us and me and Yang. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to highlight the points that um, Noam and Renzile brought up. Um, that as trans bodies re-enter, um, I guess, so the gays. You can get, okay. How I think better at that. So currently Hi. can't hear you. Um, Leila, can okay. you hear you? Hey. Okay, I was saying. Okay. Sorry, yes. the network is bad here. Okay. Um, I was saying, I feel activists and organizations can try by all means to at least provide the necessities or necessary COVID supplies to the community members, such as dental hand sanitizer, face masks, at least to help in one way or the other and including the trans community sensitize the community on how to stay safe or to take good care of themselves at least in the pandemic take care of yourself or because now we should at least see that it's it's not coming to an end anytime soon but we should take it and accept it as a new normal so i think organizations and activists should take it up and sensitize the community or have talks around it to at least make us understand how to go about it how to live with it and to stop living in fear and to provide any necessities that can help us in our day-to-day -day lives yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hello. So, hi. Um, Hello. So it was, hi. Um, thank you. Yang. Yeah. Um, so what Hello. was highlight? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Kitana. I'll open up the floor just now for questions. Okay. Hello. Okay. So what was highlighted uh, was how how we should Hello? be conscious of. Hello. Um. Hello. Hi, and can I ask you to okay. Um, so what was highlighted was um, how we should be conscious of 
when our bodies re-enter, I guess, the public, but especially for... Hello? Um, ...fem body, how the world receives them. Um, how we should find ways to ensure anonymity within even Zoom conversations like, the, like these ones. Um, for trans youth, how we should make these spaces more accessible and um, what is currently being done, I think by, I know by um, gender dynamics is reimbursing people for their data, for being part of the space. And maybe there's even a greater conversation about prepaying that data mm -hmm. um, because the reversing is the assumption that they had it in the first place. Um, when Zile brought up, I think one of all of our favorite points that can we pay trans people, right? Um, the ways in which the world expects us continuously to labor, um, to give our narratives. And I think we don't think of this when we speak to trans youth, that we should definitely pay them for their labor. Um, and Yang brought up how, and I think it's as much as we, there's a number of organizations that are providing food parcels for um, trans individuals, but we should also pro provide hand sanitizers, face masks, etc., because you can't go anywhere currently without a face mask. But also making this information around COVID more accessible um, and more digestible for all of us. Um, so I think that was, for me, a very interesting conversation and I, I believe it was interesting for all of us. And I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Um, I'll start. Kitana. Good afternoon. Apologies for joining Let Hard um, Internet uh, uh, Connecting Problems, the time I wanted to join. So I just wanted to also just add on, on what um, Yang had alluded to of uh, some of the things that are happening in our organization. I think um, he spoke about how um, the organization is trying by all means to provide for the community, but we understand the community is um, also is, it's, it's a big community where we cannot really manage to provide everything, but we are able to provide the community with um, the, um, the necessities that we, we could manage. And um, moving on forward, um, um, we have done um, some trips even out of Lusaka to ensure that we check up on the community and also we give them the necessary information that they are supposed to have and uh, not losing the community as in all that much. We've also managed to, um, we've got our outreach workers. We still have our online outreach that uh, we are still engaging with the community because we understand that um, we cannot go in, out in the community to do the outreach as usual, but we have had our um, outreach workers doing the work online. So this is one of, these are one of the things that is happening in our organization. Yeah, so I think I just wanted to add on what Yang was speaking to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kitana. Um, Zoe? Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, this is Zoe from Gender Dynamics. So I work in legal and education for the organization. And I just firstly thank you to all the uh, panelists who've been sharing. So openly and honestly about the experience. I guess my question is partly related to the last question that was uh, around uh, strengthening uh, how advocacy can uh, better support the youth. I guess a little bit uh, a step back from that, I, I think my question is around uh, whether or not uh, trans and gender diverse youth, particular mine, particularly uh, minors, whether they feel 
represented and consulted when decisions are taken uh, in advocacy spaces uh, that affect them. Thank you, I'll, I'll listen in. Thank you, Zoe. Um, would anyone on the panel like to address that? Okay. Um, so I'll address it, considering my Thimba works with a number of minors. Um, so the input we have gotten, um, where we were currently, which we're finalizing now, doing research on legal gender recognition for trans minors. And a lot of them felt that contentious decisions that are made around um, trans policies mm -hmm. are never, they're never consulted. They are not taken into consideration. Um, I think one of them actually said, which was really cute, but really heartbreaking, um, that big people sit at the table and then we have to now figure out how to use the things that they have created. And so I think they should be more intentional work for organizations to have these conversations with minors, have the conversations with their parents, um, how we, we are changing, I guess, policies and legislature believing that we're doing it for everyone without actually thinking that how does this affect a 10 year old if they are not mentioned uh, in Act 49, if um, we don't know actually how minors should be changing their gender marker in Act 49. Um, so I think they sh we should do more intentional work around how we include them. at a very amazing place where minors have become vocal. Um, maybe I have just not noticed through the years, I've always been vocal, but have become more vocal and they're, they're flagging to us that we're missing the point by just thinking that we understand because we were once kids. I'm not sure if that answers you, Zoe. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, I can't see any other questions. Um, oh, Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey. So, sorry, there, I took a moment to unmute. I, I, um, hi, everyone. I, again, thanks to an amazing panel for your uh, sharing everything and, and for your hard work. I just wanted to feed back on, on a comment that was made early in, in the conversation about funders from the Global North imposing their priorities that don't necessarily match the priorities uh, of, of trans youth. Um, and of course, that's the case. And I, I'm I'm intervening here as as someone from the global north who works closely with funders. And I really just have 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 two comments. I, I think the the folks on the call who are older and involved in more established organizations probably know these things already. But for for the younger people on the call, first, um, it's super important to keep up uh, your advocacy, calling on. Uh, funders locally and globally, you know, to recognize and respond to your priorities. Uh, in, in doing that, um, the, the most useful advocacy is, is targeting at, uh, at donors who are already to some degree interested in your issues. Uh, so if a donor is committed in some way, let's say to LGBTI work, um, trying to convince them about the need to have specific funding on trans issues and, and, and for trans youth issues uh, is more likely to be successful. If, for, if a donor is not involved at all in LGBTI issues, you, you, could, you could waste a lot of energy um, trying to get them to respond to the priorities of trans youth when they haven't even 
started to work on sexuality or gender identity at all. Um, but the second thing is the, the reality today is, and, and probably for some time is that um, HIV funding um, and, and to the sh in the short term, perhaps to some degree COVID funding, uh, th these are the kinds of things where most of the money is. And, um, and the people who you'll interact with who manage those funds um, may or may not be sympathetic to what you're saying, but, um, but their mandate is to spend money to uh, reduce the spread of HIV, to help people live longer, healthy lives with HIV or to reduce the spread of COVID or whatever. Um, and, and they almost never have the ability to reprogram that to let's say psychosocial support for trans youth or whatever. In la and, and so what I suggest you do on HIV and COVID is rather than uh, say you shouldn't be funding that, uh, and I'm, I know that's not what people said, but look at how you can take advantage of that funding to respond to what the donor wants, but to also include other things you want, you know, to make a case for why you need a more holistic approach to uh, you know, working with and for and by trans youth um, to uh, address a whole range of issues in order to reduce the spread of HIV um, to and among trans youth. So uh, yeah, just a, couple, just a couple of hints again, don't be afraid to sort of work your priorities into COVID or HIV things while saying that you'll do the HIV and COVID work and target your advocacy on trans youth issues, especially to donors already open to LGBTI issues. Thanks. Um, cool, I, I'd quite like to take that on if, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, sure, and I'm gonna also then just try answer Grace in a bit as well, who asked in the group chat, how do we sustain interventions and advocacy past COVID-19 for trans and gender diverse people? So, um, Jeffrey, I think, look, I, I get everything that you're saying, and I think um, on a more idealistic uh, point of view, I just think it's honestly horrific that our lives can only be considered when they're near to death. Um, I don't think, I, I understand that that's how international funding works, and that's very likely not to uh, change. But I think this whole idea of crisis funding is um, so incredibly dangerous because it once again only says that we care about these populations when they're dying or when they're close to death, whether that be because of AIDS or COVID. Now, I, I do know that there are ways in which to recenter those conversations so that it's um, preventative measures, which again, I just don't like the rhetoric of because I don't think my life should only matter um, when I'm, I'm close to no longer having a life. But um, that being said, and I think this links to, to Grayson's thing of, um, you know, how, how do we sustain it? Um, and I wanna, I just really love when, when Zila said, um, two things. First of all, that people's dreams have been paused. And second of all, that we need to be paying trans youth for their stories, right? Because I think that so much in academia, definitely, uh, but also I think within the NGO space, so much of what's happening around trans issues is asking people for their trauma um, in order for them to have these like wonderful stories to be able to tell their, their donors or their funders and then not giving any sort of mental health facilities in order for people to deal with that trauma, right? So if you're going to ask people to just like ball out their trauma, at the very least also pay them for that trauma at the same time. Um, the reason I'm interested in this in particular right now is because um, I've recently been uh, put on the community of advisory board for the VIT RHI um, transgender clinic in Brownfontein. And already we're seeing ways in which there's just no way 
for miners to be put into that conversation because again it's um uh, international donorship specifically um centered around aid and so i do genuinely think that everyone in um that organization are trying but i just think there's something inherently harmful when you're not taking into consideration mental health when very obviously someone being paid and uh, well two things so first of all mental health and second of all just general livability right because we know that the only way for example sex workers are spoken about is again like let's help them because they'll get aids and not any point at any point um due to just like the the inherent humanity of like doing sex work um anyway i'm rambling a bit so so i'll stop there thank you no um but also in in response to Jeffrey's um i guess question and statement is i don't think trans people want to just find themselves funded under HIV. Um, I think we're holistic human beings that deserve to be funded for our existence and how we continuously are forced to find a narrative that we can attach to HIV, that we can attach to trauma, and that's when we are worth funding, becomes a really big problem. Um, but also the ways in which we are spoken about with HIV language, right? And we have had to absorb it and have it as part of the ways in which we speak of ourselves. We speak of ourselves as a key population, which is HIV language. And basically saying that these people are the people who are spreading HIV. Um, and I think there is a point where funders need to sit down and go, actually, if our aim is to do good, then let's see how much what we are doing is actually harmful. Because when we, when we continuously spread the narrative of that, these are key populations, right, to the world, is that these people within this group are the people who are spreading HIV. And which is not true for trans people, which is not true for anyone who is a key population. We're not going out there spreading HIV. Right. And so I don't think it is ever advisable to tell any group of people that actually find yourselves within this when the problem is not us, but the problem is he who controls the money. And I think we're continuously organizing to have that conversation with he who controls the money that actually the ways in which you have interacted with us are violent and harmful. So the HIV narrative is very harmful for trans organizing. We cannot continuously just get money because of that. We cannot continuously now get money because we're spreading COVID. It's the same ways in which there's a, a narrative about sex workers spreading COVID, right? Like it's detrimental to movements. And I think um, that that is not the, the road we wanna go down while building movements in positive ways. Um, also, I, I think you said that all uh, beautifully and much more succinctly than I did, but I also just want to add that specifically when we're speaking about trans youth, if the only way you think that we can adapt to them is through AIDS, then you're immediately um, sexualizing transness and gender identity for youth who are already very specifically stigmatized through the the sexualization of their identities. Thank you so much, Nun. Um, I actually think we're running out of time. Um, yes, sorry. Um, I don't see any questions in the room. So, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in. And a huge thank you to my amazing panelists that gave of themselves for this session. And I'd also like to thank Gender Dynamics and Uranti and the Southern African Trans Forum for continuing to create these spaces.
because these spaces continue to remind all of us in these times that we are held. Um, thank you so much. Um, with, yeah. I'd like to hand over to Gender Dynamics. Oh, Iranti, Iranti. Uh, thanks uh, so much. Actually, um, thanks for very engaging points. I also see there's really great comments in the chat section, Akani. I think, uh, yeah, that was really, really great. Um, so just for everybody's attention, uh, we will be back on the 30th, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, of June. Uh, for us, um, for our seminar on depathologization. So we invite you to pay attention to be on that on that one. That's all from my side. Thanks. Right. Um, once again, thank you, um, Akani, for the engaging conversation and the panelists. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Jabu. Um, we shall see you all next on the on the thirtieth for the next round of conversations. Have a good um, day, further. Bye, everyone.